This is a general presentation. Uh, the topic you can see, exergy destruction principle. Um, many people may not have heard of exergy. Many people have heard of exergy. Uh, if you're in the mechanical engineering background, you may have heard it in recent past. It didn't appear in any textbooks until the year 1996. So it is fairly recent. So uh, those that are pre that time, it may have been called available energy. Uh, maximum useful work, maximum work, there's many words used for it. People have settled on the word exergy um, since that time and it's now in textbooks. Um, it was actually developed in the 1950s, so it's actually a new thermodynamic concept given the first and second law were developed in the 1800s, early 1800s, mid 1800s. So what am I going to do with this exergy destruction principle? It's, a, it's to give you some sort of idea of applications or implications of this concept of exergy and what that is. Of course, I'm going to have to define exergy in a moment. And it is related to energy. There is a reason. It's, it's related to energy. Uh, they just changed the N to an X for a reason. It's going to be related to the quality of energy. And in particular, I'm going to focus on exergy, this principle, and relates to large, complex thermodynamic systems. Not small, simple systems, but large, complex. Complex means interaction between many components and possibly many different types of energy gradients and energy sources. All right? So is the optimal thermodynamic system one that maximizes its use or utilization of exergy? That's the question where we're starting. Now, I uh, must uh, admit one of the places where this started was with a good friend of mine who's uh, unfortunately has passed away, but uh, Professor James Kay, a uh, colleague, close friend, and um, a brilliant mind, who came up with the extra destruction principle and brought me on board to add academic rigor to it beyond the ecology side. James was a system design engineer who worked in ecology. You'll see the influence of his work throughout the talk. Uh, and I wanted to talk as a more general audience because the relationship between engineering and outside engineering, in this case the ecology, and there's stuff to be learned. So this is a story, a bit of a story about an engineer and ecologist discovering new science and new understanding. So it's, it's a cooperative there between interdisciplinary. The engineer, I discovered ecological concepts, and you'll see some of them um, within here, and exciting new engineering applications, um, which I'll show at the end of the presentation. And the ecologist discovered some clarity, and I'll tell you the ecological community did need clarity on the thermodynamics, and we're still finding mistakes in the thermodynamics and ecological papers today. Okay. Uh, so let's contrast the two. I'm going, this is a bit of a stereotype, but engineers, we live in an area in the realm of clarity. That means when we solve a problem, we know what the environment temperature is, we have specified amount of energy coming in. We've defined our inputs and outputs in nice little system diagrams. We work in the area of clarity. In contrast, the ecologist works in an area of vagueness. They don't know all the species that may be involved in the energy transfers, et cetera, within the food web. All right, the engineer lives in a human simplified world. We make assumptions. The environment temperature is constant. That's where we start quite often, all right? And we look at quantitative patterns and correlations. If we do a lot of heat transfer and energy transfer correlations, we look for those patterns and correlations. We turn them sometimes into laws and use those to predict what's going to happen. The ecologist, however, lives in the real world. So a lot of these simplifications don't exist. Uh, the engineer lives in the real world too, but I'm just saying the ecologist, that's where they're firmly sit and they don't do the simplification the same way. They look for qualitative patterns and correlations the same way they're looking for them, but in complex systems in general, not simplified systems. And James was an ecologist and systems engineer and he brought both worlds together um, before he brought me in. So a bit of history on the sexual destruction principle, mid 1990s, Professor James Kay and Eric Schneider. Eric Schneider was the director of uh, NOAA in the US. Um, and they came up with this idea, which I will explain later, but in very short terms, it is about this maximum use, maximum utilization of exergy concept. Uh, in the late 1990s, there is some initial work uh, done with uh, my colleague uh, Jeff Louvel of NASA Marshall, uh, taking a look at some agriculture systems, some uh, heat islands, uh, Atlanta, uh, for example, flying a plane over with a 
infrared camera and just take, making some notes. I'll describe that a little later on, but some interesting observations, which has led to some current work of which we're doing in agriculture today, although it's not directly engineering. There's a lot of engineering concepts behind it, um, one of the applications. So how does nature optimize complex thermodynamic systems? So let's just step back a moment and ask that general question. We want to try to learn from nature. Uh, we often do that. And we take a look out in the literature, you take a look out in the scientific world, you'll find several different theories and put forward. Some of these have been called the fourth law of thermodynamics. A little grandiose, I think, but that's what they've been called. Uh, we start, I'm just going to list a few of them, the maximum efficiency principle. This one is promoted by engineers, primarily. It, we work with efficiency, we think the most efficient system is the best system. By the end of this talk, I'm going to introduce something called the window of vitality and the window of viability. We might not think the most efficient system is what you need to strive for. Um, all right, because there are other criteria for systems. The most efficient may be the most brittle. The most brittle may not be reliable and resilient and meet your need. So efficiency isn't the only target. So there are problems with efficiency. The maximum power principle, uh, it's been put forward uh, for quite some time. It was really popularized by Howard Odom. His brother invented the word ex ecology, so he's, uh, you can see a close connection there. But uh, the maximum power principle had to do with the maximizing useful work. And useful work is any work that can lift a weight, just to make it that simple. Uh, this concept had some limitations. Uh, systems had to be resilient, etc didn't quite pan out. Then you have maximum entropy principle. Again, scientists and engineers tend to like this one, not just engineers, but scientists like this one. You see it in the realm of droplet spray interactions and, maximum, uh, and droplet creation. You see it in the realm of weather systems and the prediction and um, how the uh, weather systems are going to interact in the world. So maximum entropy principle, but again, it has limitations. Then you have maximum m power. Now, M power refers to something called energy. Yes, energy, exergy, energy, they all involve energy somehow. Energy is this concept of systems in sort of a trophic layer of biology where you know you have your uh, full of, um, photosynthesis plants, they're then consumed by the first generation of consumers, the herbivores, and then you have your carnivores on top of that. And there might be four or five trophic layers in the food chain, uh, humans being on top of there, usually about the fifth layer, the trophic layers. In this process, you can ask the question as a human, how much solar energy went into the energy I consumed in that cereal bowl I had this morning, in that milk I drank, in that chocolate bar I had? How much energy was consumed from the sun so energy is a measure of the solar energy that came up to here. It's a very complex web-oriented, system-oriented system. This was put forward by Howard Odom again. I just mentioned his name twice because he was the one who first prom was promoting the maximum power, found its limitations, then went to M power. M power has its limitations too in that it actually doesn't fully conserve the flows, and that's a problem. If you're, if you're an engineer, we, we like things to be conserved, or physicists and the like. You have something in constructal theory by Adrian Beja, and this is a very interesting aspect. I'll get to the end. This has to do with optimizing with regard to time. Um, I will describe it at the end. And what it's describing here, just to give you a little flavor of it, is how you construct things at the most minute level and build them up to build a structure. So one example is when you apply this to your lungs. Your lungs are, have avioli at the end of the bronchial tubes and that. And those avioli is where the oxygen and CO2 is going to diffuse across into your blood and out of your blood. Now, you also have the flow friction of getting air into your lungs in a finite space. So you have constraints of finite space, finite time. And you want to maximize the amount of oxygen intake. People have known for a long time that your lungs bifurcate, they, you know, your bronchial tube then bifurcates and bifurcates so down to get to the smallest level. And there's a ratio between the tubes. And that ratio follows a fractal dimension. It's always the same dimensional ratio. Fractal dimension. But fractal is just like a ruler. What constructal theory did, and this is back in 1996, so this is a very recent theory, is it actually took the optimization of the oxygen flow, minimized the 
effectively the time, but you could think minimize the, the made the maximum efficiency uh, is another way to think of it. Minimize the time for oxygen to get in and out of your lungs, and voila, it derived from fluid dynamics and thermodynamics equations, the ratio of your bronchial tubes is an optimization. So it's a very constructal theory. Um, I'll come back to it because I think it is part of what I'm going to be describing with the extra destruction principle. And then lastly, the extra destruction principle describes systems and how they have seemed to evolve. So I'm using the word evolved in the ecological sense because it does come from the ecological community. I'll talk more about it. So now, a little bit of quiz questions. We've been talking a lot about XG and what the XG concept is. You may know it a bit and you may not. So we're going to ask you a few questions, see whether you understand the concept or it's going to be a bit of a surprise. If it's a surprise, I'll do my best to explain it quickly. So the first question is, how efficient is your home furnace? All right. So usually, if we talk about a mid-efficiency furnace, it'll be about 85%, high efficiency, 95%. And that's the amount of heat I get into the house versus the amount of heat that was consumed or produced in the furnace. If I have a natural gas furnace, the other 5 or 15 percent, depending on the efficiency of furnace, is going up the stack of your furnace. And simple, pretty cool. I combust the natural gas. I have a heat exchanger. keeps the room air separate from the combustion gases. Combustion gases go up the stack, and I heat up the room. Pretty, pretty clear. That's how a furnace works, and we have them all over the place. Right in Ontario. Okay. So imagine now how you would respond to a salesperson who tried to sell you a revolutionary type of furnace that you claimed to be 120% efficient. How are you going to respond? Well, I will tell you, he also claimed he went to Canadian Tire to buy the pieces for it. Okay. Would you be suspicious? Well, those that understand exergy say, no problem. It can be done. It's just a little more complicated of a furnace. I'm not going to go into details here and explain it, other than ex say that you've heard of these words. You've heard of a heat pump. It involves a heat pump. You've heard of a power plant. I call the heat engine here. A power plant and a heat pump. It can be easily 120% efficient. Canadian Tire just bought an engine and a refrigerator or an air conditioner. can make this system. Why doesn't it exist? Well, people know about it. It does exist. It's used by a large industry, uh, industry, for example. But it's more complicated, which means it has higher maintenance, not as resilient. So there's, there's things that get used because they're not as resilient, even though they're more efficient. So you don't optimize for efficiency all the time. Okay? And notice here, if you actually do a second law calculation, how much, let me go back. Notice how much energy I could get in. For 100%, or let's say 100 joules of energy from my natural gas, I can get almost 1,300 joules into the house. Do that ratio, that means your natural gas furnace in your house today is only about 7% efficient compared to the ideal. But there's a reason we use it. Okay? And in the future, we may not. We may actually evolve to use this type of system. This is an exergy conserving furnace. There's the word exergy. Exergy conserving. I'm preserving the ability to do work. I'm preserving the exergy. Exergy is a measure of type of work. OK, so first thing, just remember, intuition is a poor substitute for the physics of thermodynamics. So if you weren't familiar with this, probably you wouldn't have gotten the answer, wouldn't have gotten the answer. And secondly, Intuition can seriously limit one's ability to conceive of alternative systems. Right? People probably didn't conceive, if you didn't know about XG, of that double system. You just wanted to create heat. I got fuel, create heat, goes through one system. I'm not putting a whole bunch of things together. And there's a corollary here, uh, and this is just a little bit of a, in the theory. There's actually an infinite number of XG conserving systems. Reversal, they're actually reversible, too. There's an infinite number of them. That means there's no unique, perfect solution. And that is sort of like the perfect endpoint of efficiency. There's no unique one. And that's very interesting. Because when you start talking about large, complex systems, and again, I'm going to use ecology as my thermodynamic system analogy, not all ecosystems are different. But is one better than the other? No, they evolve differently. 
but they could all have similar characteristics and be similarly strong, similarly resilient, similarly efficient, similarly, okay? Now, let's just do one more question. I've sort of got you on the first one maybe. Here's the second one. Ideally, and the key word here is ideally, so we're dealing with, you know, perfect systems. But it's a, good, it's a starting point. This is where engineers like to start, and I'm an engineer. Uh, does it take less natural gas to bring one kilogram of ice at minus 20 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees or 60 degrees Celsius? So imagine someone uh, is out in uh, BC and they can either walk up to the Banff Springs and collect 60 degrees Celsius water or they can walk into an ice cave in Jasper and get minus 20 degrees Celsius ice. Which one are they going to choose to use the minimum amount of natural gas to heat to 100 degrees? Now, you know by this time it's probably a trick question, and it is. The answer is, first off, and I'm not going to show you, the answer in here is actually going to be a little bit wrong, because the first thing you should be asking me is a question, because I don't know the answer. And what was that? What's the outside temperature? Well, I'm going to choose the outside temperature as 20 degrees, which is halfway in between. All right? Anyway, with it halfway in between, it takes 3.3 times less natural gas to bring the ice to a boil. All right? And again, those who know extra G understand it. Those that don't, it doesn't make sense. And theoretically, I can bring it to 88 degrees. But again, I'm going to show you the same type of idea. Here's the simple idea that you normally have for heating. And this looks somewhat similar to what we had before. Here's the more complex idea. And it involves a heat pump again. I'll just emphasize the heat pump. I'm not going to describe it in detail, but there's a heat pump in there. There's a heat engine or power plant. But the first thing is I'm going to bring the water up from the minus 20 to 20. I'm going to collect, collect in a storage reservoir the work, work I could use to light a light bulb, to lift a weight. I'm going to collect it, and then I'm going to use to heat it up to the maximum, and voila, you get to 100 degrees. So, like I said, we're not going to go into details, but it's a way of thinking. It's, I'm conserving exergy. Okay, this is an exergy-conserving system. So remember, again, intuition. It's a poor substitute for the thermodynamics theories. And intuition can seriously limit your ability to conceive. Now the ecological aspect to this. So I want to create some new ways of thinking, especially for the engineers in the audience, when you're taking a look at these systems. Any system out of equilibrium, any system out of equilibrium with its environment has the potential to do useful work. And again, useful work is the ability to lift the weight. All right? So any system, and I'm just going to use one here with temperature in it, but it, I could have surface tension, uh, pressure work. I can have electrical work. I can have any other type of work modes. All right? I'm just going to use temperature for the moment. Right? But I can be in imbalance, and I can always get work out. But the example I just did, in this axis, I have x for exergy and t here for temperature. And what we have is the temperature of the minus 20 degrees Celsius ice has a greater exergy than the 20 degrees Celsius water. And because of the higher exergy, if I just go from the low temperature side and bring it to the high temperature side, I have a greater exergy, and that's why I was able to heat it up to 100 degrees, which would be a higher exergy even further, because it has shorter distance to go. The point is, here is the environment, T0. And any system, whether I'm at a higher temperature or a lower temperature, I can get work out of it. I just change the direction of the heat transfer through a heat engine or whatever. All right? But the concept, it's the concept that's important. I often have professors tell me that exergy is not needed. It's not this idea that's needed. Well, as soon as they say it's not the idea that's needed, that's where they've made their mistake. It's the ideas that it plants that makes you think differently about energy systems that's important. It's a decision-making tool. It's a tool that ecosystems seem to, not just a tool, it's a tool for engineer, but it seems to be a principle on which ecosystems tend to evolve and understand. Ecosystems seem to understand this out of equilibrium has the ability to do work no matter which way I'm out of equilibrium. They've naturally adapted to that. 
So there's things to think about when we look at complex systems, and I'll maybe show some shortcomings later. One more sort of background again, those who know XGD, this will make sense, those that don't, but I want to just relate it now to some systems to give it some practical side uh, before going to a little more theory. So this is a typical power plant, very simplified Rankine cycle power plant. You heat up a boiler, turns a turbine, makes electricity. In this case, I was assuming 35% of the work output into electricity. Uh, maybe there's a generator here that's 90% efficient, so it's 90% of that, but there's your energy out. There's some condensation here. This is the cooling side of things. That's why you find power plants near lakes and near rivers. They have to cool themselves. They're large cooling towers. Or if you look at the um, halt in the gas power plant on the 401, you notice that it's this little blue building with this large structure raised above the ground. That large structure above the ground, which is very large, is the heat exchanger and it's simply the condenser. All right? And the boilers where you put the energy in. Now, this is the energy flow. This would be a 35% efficient system because for 100% of the natural gas, and that Halton system's a natural gas power plant, 100% of the energy I put in, I get 35% out of electricity or work. 35% efficient, right? But if I take a look at the exergy analysis, and exergy is now this useful work, the quality of work, what it's telling me is that I could have gotten 50% out at the input. There is a, there's a the thermal energy has this ability to do work and not do work, and there's a little more there. And we've got different numbers coming through. So I started using Exergy to take a look at the analysis here. And when I do that, I realize, maybe I've rushed on this, but hopefully not, I realize that there is an Exergy destruction part that occurred in the boiler. So I use something called a reheater. I, I may be catering to mechanical engineers today, but let's just say I can base this it would probably a whole lecture, but I could run through this, how to design this as a mechanical engineer in exergy, or I could do it the old-fashioned way and just use the first and second law of thermodynamics. All right, so now let's talk about what, what's this exergy thing? What's this thing I kind of fooled you with with a couple of problems? They're truthful answers, but you may not understand them. So to understand exergy, we've got to put it in its place and discuss energy. Energy has four characteristics. The one we're very familiar with is magnitude. It has size, right? The chocolate bar has 220 calories. That's a magnitude of the energy. Of, we're familiar with that, right? You're also familiar with the idea of form, right? Kinetic energy, you know there's kinetic energy. Someone hits you, that hurts. It's got energy in it, right? You know that when you eat a candy bar, I'll go back, I love candy, so I guess I'm talking a lot about chocolate bars today. The candy bar, it's food. I can eat it. I throw dirt in my mouth, stones in my mouth, I can't eat it. The form matters, right? So energy has some sort of form, right? I, I'm, a, I'm not a plant eater, so cellulose goes, I'm not going to be able to consume cellulose. Other animals can, right? Has direction, the second law of thermodynamics, this entropy concept uh, that's out there, people here in high school, the old, your room gets messier, but it takes work to, to make it cleaner. Humpty Dumpty falls off the wall, takes work to put them back together again. That sort of thing. Flow goes from, in the more practical sense, flow goes from hot to cold with energy. Right? Heat transfers, hot to cold. That's because of the second law. It doesn't go from cold to hot because that would require the entropy to decrease. That's just the way the, the law and second law works. Then we have this idea of quality. And this is where exergy fits in. Quality. It's the amount of work any form of energy can do. And it's a combination of the first law and the second law. This is why some people don't see it as useful, because it's really just combining those two. So if we already know the first law and second law, which is the first and third thing on here, why do I need to put them together to create something new? Because there's one more thing that gets added here, the environment. The environment is ignored if you only look at the first law and second law. And I'll give you, I'll, I'm going to talk about a Nobel Prize winner shortly who ignores the environment but is very famous and has done some great work. All right? Um, but we'll get to that shortly. All right. Now, I want to introduce the idea of general exergy concept. This is my definition. There are many definitions out there, maximum useful work, maximum work, uh, and the like. But what I like to do is actually call it the maximum useful to the dead state work. 
And why? I'm the only one I know that does this, but that specifies every single assumption that goes into its derivation. It defines every single constraint that goes into this idea of exergy. So, so we go along with this idea, maximum useful to the dead state, and this is what people don't include, it explicitly calls out the environment. And that's important, because it's going to affect how you optimize a system, how you make it more resilient for a particular location. Uh, and we'll call this the quality or usefulness, if I just want to be a little looser with the terms. All right, the quality of energy, the usefulness of the energy. Any system out of equilibrium has potential to work. We've already mentioned that. And intrinsic exergy. Intrinsic exergy provides a measure of how far out of equilibrium. Every single piece of matter, this pointer here, all right, has a mass to it, has materials to it. It has an exergy value to it. Your body has an exergy value to it. Anything that has mass in it, has energy with it, has an exergy value to it. That's the intrinsic exergy. It's in there, no matter what you do. All right? Out of equilibrium means, though, that intrinsic exergy is going to be relative to an environment. I probably should have highlighted the word environment there. All right? But just remember, everything has intrinsic exergy. Intrinsic could be zero if it's in equilibrium with the environment. All right? Another thing I want to just put across is this is a black box. When I get into some of the biology aspects here that will lead into some of the engineering, it's a black box concept. That means I do not want you looking inside the box. When I put a boundary around something, you don't look inside. You're going to want to look inside. Everybody looks inside. But you're not going to want, you're not going to look inside. Okay? You'll see what I mean in a moment, and I'll explain where that comes up. Okay, so exergy versus entropy. I need to do this little discussion here because entropy is related to exergy. And there's a, if you actually do the derivation and do the math behind it, you come up with something called the ghost dolo theorem, and you discover that exergy is actually proportional to entropy production. So these people who say exergy doesn't offer anything new are right in the sense I could solve everything with entropy. But darn, this environment temperature sticks in there. The environment becomes important again. So I'm just going to keep emphasizing that environment because that's what I find missing in a lot of analysis of systems. To put it in now a more practical conceptual terms of why I would emphasize exergy, if I use entropy, I start with zero entropy, produ or entropy production. I start with zero entropy production. And I got a system, and I'm going to convert electricity to this light. And I start with, a, there's entropy production. But how much is there? Where does it go? What's the maximum efficiency? Where do I end? <laughs> you actually, you have to start putting constraints and solving the problem to do that. Nice thing with exergy is I can do the calculation right beforehand, and I know where the end point is. I know where I'm going to get. And when I have exergy destruction, which is the equivalent of entropy production, I know how much is left over and I know how far to go. So with exergy, the nice conceptual thing about it is, is I know how far I can go. If I lose stuff, I know how far I've got left I can go. With entropy, I've gone a certain distance. I don't know how far more I can go. Unless I really analyze the problem. It doesn't naturally fall out of the problem. So conceptually, that's one of the advantages of thinking about um, exergy. And again, we've got to literally look outside the back. So here's the uh, Nobel Prize winner, um, uh, Prigogine. Now, he used, when he developed this idea of dissipative structures for ecology and um, that, he used this idea of entropy. And this is one way you can do it. You can derive the second law and all the thermodynamics this way. He has entropy production inside a small little volume. And then he has entropy transfer across into that or out of, you know, it could be positive or negative. And that will tell you what the entropy of the system is. The entropy produced in the system and the entropy that flows in equals the entropy in the system. Pretty simple, looks so straightforward. It's a nice balanced equation. Okay, this is a system-centric view. This is generally the view engineers take of energy conversion systems. I look at my system. When Westinghouse builds uh, or GE builds a turbine. They're looking at the turbine. They look at the blades. They're looking in their system. They're not looking outside. Someone may be, but they're not doing it. The engineers usually working on the system aren't. Now, if you do this, it hides something. It hides the environment. 
the environment is actually where this outside entropy comes, but it's kind of hiding. And that really is important. All right? It de-emphasizes the role of the environment. So that's one thing. It's there, but it just de-emphasizes. You don't see it. Uh, for those that are, have done thermodynamics, and you ever saw the second law of thermodynamics, there's this temperature term. You have a heat transfer over temperature term. You want to you basically have students, uh, you look over half your class, get a question wrong on the exam, ask them what that temperature is on the bottom of the second law, on the bottom of the heat transfer. They go, oh, I don't know. Well, it's simple. It's this one. Right there. It's the environment. But it's de-emphasized even in our textbooks. Right? When you take the system-centric I'm talking the engineering, introduction to engineering textbooks. Um, and we must construct our system such that the entropy change in the environment is zero. Right? The only entropy change is, is occurring here. We're assuming this is reversible and there's no entropy change out here. That's really what's happening. OK, now what's the implications? Well, let's take a look at what I'm going to call the classical entropy production viewpoint. This is another way to derive the second law. I look at entropy production, because the second law is all about entropy production. It's got to be greater than or equal to zero. For that, I have to look at an isolated system. When I do that, I have to include the environment and this in between, um, this environmental entropy that moves across. In the isolated system, the change of entropy in my system is now the change of entropy from production, the one that crosses the boundary, and any change that occurs in the environment. All right? And the second law of thermodynamics says that for this, that the entropy of production is greater than or equal to zero. All right, so how can this help us or affect us when we're designing energy systems? And I'm going to use cycle and plant efficiencies here to sort of put those in a practical sense. When I do a cycle efficiency, so I'm, I want to, this could be an auto spark ignition engine in your car, a diesel engine in your truck. It could be the power plant I've shown here, like the Rankine cycle and that generates your electricity in Ontario Hydro, or power, <coughs> Ontario power generation. Um, whatever this energy conversion system is in here, right? We tend to want to look inside. We have heat transfer in, heat transfer out, work out, and we look inside and we analyze this. That's the system centric. And we're going to determine some way to calculate the efficiency of each of these components. That's a system centric view. We ignore the environment. And this is where people actually get confused on the second law. It's because quite often in your first um, course and even your second course and even sometimes your third course in thermodynamics when you use the second law, you'll use the temperature in that second law at the boundary. Why? That's an emphasis, or you use the system temperature. And that's because you use the system temperature because you're de-emphasizing the environment. And this is what confuses some students sometimes. It's because then all of a sudden they'll come across a problem where they're only given the temperature in the environment and not the system. So they plug it into the equation to get the right answer, got the, got the exam question right, but don't know why. Okay? And it's because the temperature in the environment is actually what you have to use, and you assume you're, you're assuming the environment's reversible if you don't. Okay, mechanistic analysis of a cycle efficiency would look inside this, maybe come up with a 40% efficient, and it's done. That's the system centric. If I wanted to look at the plant efficiency, so this is how now this system centric view, I'm going to change it to a plant efficiency, which is the isolate system view. Because this system has to work in a larger system. It has to work, and this is what we're talking, complex systems are about taking some small system and making it work in a larger system. How do you put these large complex systems together? Well, in the plant efficiency here, I now recognize this external thermal energy reservoir at a high temperature, thermal energy reservoir at a low temperature, and the mechanical energy reservoir. And uh, these are some second law calculations here. I can do some calculations on it. But the bottom line is, when you do this particular analysis, you find your plant can operate differently. And I'll give a couple examples. So for example, if I wanted to run, and I'll use geothermal energy, since this is a sustainable energy. If I was to take geothermal energy, go down about three or four kilometers, I would get a temperature of around 80 degrees Celsius. Let's say four or five kilometers. Let's say 90 degrees Celsius. All right? 90 degrees Celsius in the average atmospheric temperature here in Kitchener-Waterloo, let's say um, 
10 degrees Celsius, all right? So you have a differential there of 100 degrees Celsius. That's just barely enough for organic Rankine cycle to generate work at a practical economic level. Now, you take that geo, same geothermal system and you put it up north. You put it up Northwest Territories in Nunavut. Now, the average out there temperature might be zero. You've got 110. That small difference of a, a temperature difference, so 90 to the minus 10 is 100. Am I doing that right? So 80. 90 to 10 is an 80 degree temperature. That's just barely enough. Oh, oh. Who did that? OK, you've seen lots of pictures here. Did I do that for a long time? Do you forget everything you saw? Forget, forget what you saw. <laughs> wow, I really did a lot. I wasn't going to go that. By the way, those are extra slides too, just for information. Um, so anyway, if you bring it into the different environment in the Arctic, you've got a larger temperature difference, and it can become more practical to use that organic Rankine cycle. That's the short form of it. Um, just to take this idea of taking these little subsystems and putting them together. Now I'm talking about the more complex systems. This is a classic food web um, from biology, from ecology sort of system. So you see the ecologists will do these energy systems. They're, they don't realize necessarily they're doing thermodynamics at the time, but that's what they're doing. For uh, mechanical engineers and people designing energy systems, we'll take our subsystems and we'll put them all together into the larger systems. We can do that, all right? Um, and so this is what you would call a top-down approach, all right? The isolated system is a top-down approach. I start large and I go small. The Prigogine approach was start small and go large, bottom up. And so it's really a question of which way you go. Do you start with the environment and move inwards? Or do you start with your system and then find out what the environment is? And most engineers start with the system and go outwards. I'll design my turbine. I'll design my geothermal system. Then I'll decide what the environment it's going to be in, right? Now, of course, the person who's overseen the project might have given you specifications because they looked on the outside in, and it's already done. But a lot of people don't think that way. So trying to, this is a way of thinking. It's not, OK? Um, Chambadel's engine, this is a classic problem to give students on an exam. You, you just give them a problem. All I'm going to say is it's really an ideal, perfect engine. You have a heat exchanger has some entropy production associated with it, irreversibilities, extra destruction. And you say, find what the maximum work the system can give you. And quite often, the students will get it wrong. And the reason they get it wrong is because when you say minimize the entropy production or maximize the work output, you say forgot about the entropy production that occurs in the environment from the heat that you rejected. Because the heat rejection here has to be at a finite temperature. Because if the heat rejection's at the environment temperature, you get no work out. If the heat rejection's at the high temperature, you get no heat transfer, no work out. So there's actually an optimum. And if you optimize without considering the environment, you get the wrong answer. Again, another classic, simple example, thinking of the environment. You're starting to get the message here about the environment, thinking outside the box, right? Not in the box. Now, what about a cup of coffee? Where's all the fun occurring with a cup of coffee? There's a lot of thermodynamic fun occurring here. All right? By fun, it means something that's controlling it, something that's doing something with the coffee, right? Where is it occurring? Well, if we take a look, what you have is you have your hot coffee, you have your room temperature, probably both approximately constant. There might be a small gradient and a huge gradient in the middle. That huge gradient is where all the entropy production is. That's where all the fun is. So the fun isn't in the coffee. The fun isn't in the environment. It's actually in between the two. Ooh, that's a concept we tried not to get told about. The fun is between the two systems that we tend to analyze. Okay. And so what I've done is I've taken that and said, here's a, this is a typical way of deriving the second law. You identify a system, identify an isolated system. You throw in the environments, the reference environments, which I already sort of showed. But I call something the immediate environment. This is a new concept for many. You think of it separately. The immediate environment is important. So not only is the environment important, right? I already know I have to consider the temperature out here. I've already sort of shown that. 
But I have to consider the immediate environment because that's where all the entropy is being produced or may, we may not want it to be produced. So where's all the fun happening? And this is where Prigogine's sat. And I'm arguing you should be considering both if you're going to look at a system in the large scale. All right, don't ignore the environment. Uh, sorry, questions. The new way of thinking, negative structures, gradients. I've just given a hint of that. What I want to do in these last few minutes, I am going to go pretty fast, is I've got a lot of slides of results, of observations. And what I want to do is give you a flavor, and then you can ask some questions. All right? So I'm going to skip over these. These are more theory. I can go into a lot of detail here. Uh, nature of horrors a gradient. Um, great stuff. All right. So natural systems self-organize. Human systems self-organize. If you look at if you look at Paris, Paris self-organized with small streets when people walked everywhere and they had horses. As you got cars, the streets, blocks got longer, the roads got wider. It's self-organized, right? So it's not just natural systems, but human systems self-organize. But I'm going to look at a tornado in the bottle. If I look at a tornado in the bottle, when you, a tornado in the bottle is just, there's a, I should have brought the little toy, but there's a little toy you can put between two pop bottles and you can have water in the top, and it'll go down, and it'll eventually form a tornado on the top as it drains to the bottom. Now, if you don't put the little device that causes it to swirl, it just glug, 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 glugs, right? Which one drains faster? Well, the tornado drains faster. The one with structure drains faster. The one with structure drains faster. So there is some way to put these systems together so they utilize things more. And so in the tornado in the bottle, um, put, depending on the water height you put in here, ran a little experiment. This is a little cute experiment. I'll show you some more fancy experiments in a moment. But if I do the tornado in the bottle, you'll find that you actually get these increasing entropy destruction rates. It wants to destroy entropy. The system does not want to be in equilibrium. Things want to get out of equilibrium. They want to go, sorry, things want to get into equilibrium. They, they don't want to stay out of equilibrium. Okay? So that's an interesting observation. And they use structures to do it. So how would you design your large mechanical, large civil, large planning systems to use energy so the structures does what you want it to do? Okay? Bernard cells, Bernard cells. This one's a little more, this is a more technical um, um, example, but it's very interesting. So Baynard cells are these little convective cells that form when you have a hot source on the bottom, a cold source on the top. We all know hot air rises, so at some point the, the air is going to want to rise, or the liquid or whatever the fluid is in there. And if you take a look at the top and you do some shadow graphs, you can see the cells form. So once that air starts moving, these little cells are turning around, convecting up and down. Here's another picture, um, a Schlieren photograph. All right, so what happens, the cells initially, when you have a very small temperature difference, nothing's happening. You just have a linear temperature gradient between the two. Right? And, and there's a slow heat transfer. All of a sudden, snap, convection cells form. And you get this very shallow boundary layer, high temperature gradient, low temperature gradient, high temperature gradient. Here's your convective cell moving the temperature very quickly because it's very efficient at moving the energy. Now, here's the interesting thing. And this, we went back to the data a couple of times. And maybe someday someone might repeat these experiments. But what we observed was, and you observed this, is that when you heat it up further, so here's your increasing the temperature. You can imagine this is what we're doing here. As you increase it, all of a sudden, there'll be another snap, and the cells will change. There'll be like more of them, and, and then snap, there'll be another change. And each time, there's these changes. So the system reconfigures its structure. So not only the structure affect how you use the energy, but you need to reconfigure it depending on what the energy flow is. So if a city brings in more energy, the structure may have to change. Now, how can it change? Is it able to change? Did you design it to change? You may not have, and then you have problems. But if you thought ahead, maybe you could have designed it to change. All right? I'll take a look at some ecosystems here. Solar energy, that's the input of energy. That's, when we talk about renewable energy, we always want solar is what we want to use. That's the ultimate source. Maybe fusion is the ultimate source. Well, this is fusion energy. All right, so some observations. 
when we take a look at um, some ecosystems uh, in the past, we took a look, and it, unfortunately this is sort of backwards here, but the old, this is coldest on top, warmest on the bottom. That's why I say it's backwards. So an old field was cold. When we mow the field right beside it, it was warmer. This is over time. A hay field, which is more structured, or sorry, more artificial, not as allowed to be freely structured, less resilient, um, people would argue, because it's more susceptible to um, problems. Anyway, it's going to be at a higher temperature. And a lawn, which is probably the most controlled system, right? We like to control systems as engineers and as humans. It is the hottest. It is the least natural. So quite often, we build systems that are not natural. And if we're building not natural, nature's had a long time to learn how to use energy very well. Why are we doing the opposite quite often? And now, I just used ecology to write that question. But you can think about that question in terms of when we build our vehicle systems, when we, in terms of when we build our power plants, and whether we do distributed systems or centralized systems, all right? Just to give you some ideas. Um, again, some flyovers. You see clear cuts, uh, very hot. Roads, the hottest. Ponds, shelter woods, um, Douglas firs, cooler. So the ecosystems are cooler. OK, that's interesting. The ecosystems are cooler. We, we sort of know this. But you've got to think they've already optimized a complex system, right? So if you take a look at a city, and this is where we use energy, these reds are hot spots, right? This is Atlanta. This is uh, just prior to the Olympics. Uh, it was flown over to figure out where basically the comfort of people visiting Atlanta, where they might um, plant trees and put water stations, et cetera, in the city. But think about the city and the way it's designed. It's designed to be hot. Cities are hotter than the environment. That's not the way ecology systems Design. They design actually to be cool. Ecosystems are designed to be cool. I'll show some results to show that. So if the evolution is towards cool systems and we build hot systems, we're probably going in the wrong direction. This is showing you the hot and cool within southern Ontario. Lots of hot spots. Right? And you can Hamilton, Toronto, Kitchener, Waterloo, Guelph. Right? So here's the idea. This is the whole heat island effect uh, people talk about. That, I would actually argue, is we've designed the energy system poorly if we built a heat island effect. Okay. Uh, to give some, sort of relate this back to sort of uh, a practical side. Now, this is the agriculture side of things. But just surface temperature and being cool. Uh, what you have here is the amount of nitrogen added. And about 100 um, kilograms per hectare is considered the norm to add, all right, in Ontario. And this is the temperature. And again, um, I apologize, the temperature is in reverse. Cools on top, warms on the bottom. But when you don't have much nitrogen added, zero nitrogen, the system is hotter than when you add the right amount. And then after that, pretty stable. After a certain point, it's pretty stable. Well, that's telling you there's some sort of optimum in which you can operate. And there's some place you don't want to operate as a system. Have we been designing cities around this? instead of up here. Probably have to an extent. We, we're improving. We're putting in uh, white roofs where there used to be black roofs in the southern states, and it cools the cities. And we're doing things to cool the cities. But initially, they weren't designed to be cool. Um, this, is a, this is that plot you saw at the very beginning. This is just a, a harvested uh, product yield. And this is temperature. The correlation is 0.86. That's an extremely high correlation. So you actually see that you get more production better performance in a way from an ecological system when the temperature was lower. Now, why am I talking about temperature? The lower temperature is actually corresponds to, although I don't show the equation, higher exergy available. Because the environment temperature is important. The one temperature is the sun. The other temperature is the Earth's surface. The sun's hot, and you want the largest temperature difference to get the most exergy. So this actually is related to the exergy. We pursued this research because of the concept of exergy, not because we thought temperature affected yield. Exergy led to this research. All right? This is the work of Hebo sitting in the audience here now, taking a look at weeds. Weeds offer a type of stress. There's a bit of theory here, a difference between stress and development. Um, and just say there's some relationship here. But you take the thermal images, 
And you can see that there's different heights or quality of corn, stressed and unstressed. And these would be your hot systems. Your more stressed systems are your hotter systems. So there might actually be benefits, not like cooler systems, it feels nicer in the cities, you're less stressed. There, be less, the energy system should be less stress in a well-designed system. If I'm reflecting away the energy, I don't need as much air conditioning. Right? I don't need to use as much energy. Again, it's better. So less stress system in an engineering sense is probably what we should be shooting for. I'll skip over this one. Just want to show this, and then I think I'll end it there, is the, the mean leaf surface temperature, and this again, data was collected, every single plot versus nitrogen showed what we expected, a slight decrease in the temperature as you go along. So the predictions are holding up. They're not strong, but they are a direction for evolution. They are a direction the systems seem to take. Um, I, mean, I am gonna, I'll, I'll end on this one. This is the constructal theory. So constructal theory is this very interesting one. Lots of things going for it. On the lungs, I already described how it describes how the branching diameters work, and it's derived from first principles, 1996. Before then, people knew about the ratios. They measured them, but they just didn't understand why. It's a balance between flow friction and diffusion rate. That's really what it is. Okay? With constraints of bifurcation in space, with those constraints built in. Trees, river deltas, et cetera, seem to follow this. But what's interesting, and sort of the limitation of this, is that these optimizations, although this is a nice, very nice theory, I've noticed that all these optimizations require some form of equilibrium environment. Again, it's thinking about the environment. Your lungs live and have been optimized within a very homogeneous temperature environment, or a very small fluctuation environment. Okay. When your river deltas, your trees, even though the environment's changing, it's still relative homogeneous. But if you think about trees, they don't all branch out the same way. They've adapted slightly different. Again, that goes back to the actual principle that there's multiple systems that you can have that are, one's not necessarily better than the other. There's certain advantages, disadvantages. So the constructive theory doesn't quite do it all. The extra destruction principle, what it's trying to do is say, there's a certain amount of work available. If I lower the system temperature, if I optimize systems with the exergy conserving idea, if I take the environment into consideration, I should be able to design a better overall system than if I just use my system-centric viewpoint and want to put systems together. A simple way of putting this is having everything at optimal efficiency isn't necessarily the best. Um, I know I was going to say I was going to end here, but I remembered I told you one more thing. And so I'm going to, um, yeah, it's a nice space shuttle picture. I'll end on this one. The window of vitality, the window of viability. These are properties of complex systems. Um, these are from the ecology. But if you think about it, they have engineering and energy system concepts. So the window of vitality is you must have enough complexity, but not too much. All right, complex system strives for the optimum. And it says a tractor here. That's, they, they, they talk about the tractors in chaos theory and ecology literature. Not a minimum or a maximum. So when you start to minimize and maximize, you're in trouble. Um, and window viability is more engineering-like. A system loses robustness if it's too efficient or too inefficient. So if you think about it, if I was to drive a Mercedes-Benz in the middle of the Sahara Desert and I got sand particles into the injectors, that car's dead. But if I had a nice carbureted engine, which is an older generation of vehicle, it's going to be able to run in that environment. This window of viability, window of robustness, it moves. It moves. What is viable today? Is, it, is an 8-track viable today? No. But it was very viable in the 60s. But it wasn't viable before then. This window of viability moves. Efficiencies move. What's available to you moves. One of the things in terms of energy when we, I, we see here, though, is that what we tend to do is the way we're evolving our systems, our structures, is to use more energy. We do not evolve them to use less. We use less energy for certain things. So take the automobile, for example. Is it more efficient? 
Sure is. Through the 80s, a lot of what, since the energy crisis 1972, they, they worked on a, the efficiency greatly. But what did we do? In the year 2000, more trucks than cars are sold. Ford in 2022 is not going to build any more cars. We got bigger systems. We compensated. I hope no one has a cell phone because it's extremely inefficient. Or a laptop. Not as efficient as a system that's plugged into the wall and can automatically turn off. The chips are really efficient, but they just gave you more power on a smaller. But you've, all of a sudden, it's wireless headphones, more batteries, etc. All right. Anyway, I'm going to leave it there. I don't know if this is a nice smooth ending or just an introductory ending, but the idea is this idea of exergy, maximum useful work, leads to some interesting ideas, particularly considering the environment and that we may not have been doing that in a lot of systems we've designed to date. Thank you. And I don't know if we have much time for questions, but.